Hi everyone, it's Tamsin from the Coffee Club here. Um, we're starting the event on how to measure your brand health in partnership with a test. I'll take you through quickly um, what the Coffee Club does for those of you who haven't heard of us before and then I'll hand over to Vanessa. who will take you through a 30 minute presentation and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, if you have any questions throughout, just type them in uh, the question section and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so I'm part of the Coffee Club which is a great bunch of entrepreneurial marketeers who get together in fun, casual settings. Um, our whole point of existing is to make your lives easier. So originally we did lots of events in person in London and face-to-face. -face. Um, that could be like speaker events, workshops, round tables on any kind of um, helpful topics. And um, recently, obviously, with all the coronavirus things, we've moved online, um, but we still really want to help in any way possible. Um, so the two ways that you can help us is by being vocal. So anything that you need help with, whether it's um, what to talk about on social media now, um, how to manage teams remotely, just give us a shout and we can um, look into kind of our network of a thousand marketeers and find someone that can help with that, whether it's an event or a connection or a mentor. And then the other thing is spreading the word. Um, the Coffee Club is all kind of word of mouth and everyone's welcome. So if you think of anyone that could benefit from being part of the Coffee Club, just give us a shout. Um, and here's a few examples of what's coming up. So we've got an event that's actually tomorrow, which is called How to Be Positive and Decisive in Times of Panic. We're keeping that small kind of eight to 10 people um, discussing with Lottie, who's the founder of Copy Club's mentor about how he deals with times of panic and um, it's very relevant right now. Then we've got more of an inspiring chat from um, Nicola, the UK marketing manager of Tony's Chocoloni. Um, she's gonna talk about how they do marketing, kind of take you through brand story and strategy and kind of an inspiring um, future planning session. And then we've got a workshop on how to win over socially conscious consumers. That's also kind of workshoppy vibes. So it's only 10 people and we've only got three tickets left for that one. And then finally, how to market yourself without feeling awkward um, is also coming up. So if you've got any questions or you want to hear more about the Coffee Club, there's my details kind of on the screen now. And um, we'll share them around later as well. But for now, I'll head, hand over to Vanessa to take you through the presentation. Hi all, hope you're well. Um, so I'm Vanessa from Attest and I'll be co-hosting this um, with Fabiola from Attest as well. Thank you Tamsin for that introduction to the Copy Club. Um, as Tamsin said at the beginning for those of you who may have not caught this, this is um, a webinar about how to measure your brand health and it's in conjunction with the Copy Club today. So um, Tamsin's a uh, little introduction into what they do, which is really exciting. So we're delighted to be able to partner with them. Okay, so what will we be covering today? So I wanted to run through a quick agenda of what we'll actually be looking at. So introductions to who we are and who a test is. Then we'll kind of crack on to the kind of real nitty gritty measuring your brand and how to do it, which is what I think everyone wants to know. And then also finally kind of landing on what you can do with this type of information to inform your strategic business decisions. Um, but with that, Without further ado, I'll introduce myself a little bit more. So I am Vanessa West. I'm a client experience executive here at Attest. I'm a member of the ACE team. So that stands for the Attest Center of Excellence. And so whilst, as Fabiola will take you through, our platform is super intuitive. The ACE team are here to run through training to get you all up to speed in terms of um, how to use the platform best practice not only on the platform itself but research best practice as well as us always being here to be on hand with survey creation because we appreciate that sometimes you know there's an amazing tool that you can use that you can create your own brand trackers on but actually you sometimes need that little bit of expertise to just help you really refine it and optimize it to be as best as it can um, our goal at in the ace team is to make you masters of your own research um, my own kind of background is I am a traditional market researcher, actually. So I worked at uh, Ipsos Mori and Hall and Partners. I've run huge brand trackers, but actually the way we do it at test is a little bit different. So I'm really excited to share that with you um, in due course. 
Um, but as I said, co-presenting this with me today is Fabiola. So over to her to introduce herself and take you through who a test is um, and what our mission is uh, as a test. Over to you, Fabs. Hello. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And hi, everyone. Excited to be here. I'm Fabiola. And as Vanessa mentioned, I'm part of a test. I'm part of the business development team here and have been for slightly over a year now. My role is to speak to companies to support them in understanding slightly about their challenges and objectives within brand and marketing, as well as introducing them to a test and the way we help solving those challenges. Today, we'll be learning extensively about brand trackers and the benefit that this can bring to marketing and brand overall. And, and before doing that, we briefly wanted to introduce a test to those of you who aren't familiar with it, as well as to those that perhaps came across it a while ago, but aren't sure of what a test does. And the reality is that in the world where we live in today with extensive access to information and dynamism from consumers, brands have to constantly adapt and make sure that they cater for the market in an innovative, agile, and personalized way in a way that fits the needs and problems of those who are their target audiences. But when market research and the process of getting insights is um, slow, expensive, and lacks flexibility as it has historically been to obtain insights, it perhaps becomes more difficult for brands to adapt quickly and make changes that would give them competitive advantages. And also not having the access to this information could end up costing a lot to organizations, as you might know already, and can turn into big losses for brands. And this is the main problem that we're trying to solve here at a test. Brands, companies, agencies really struggle to get insights and market research in the ways that suit them when they need it most. And a test solves this problem by taking the 10 to 20 usual steps involved in market research and consumer insights and compressing it down to one step, allowing brands and agencies access to 100 million individuals who are consumers to ask questions, surface insights and take action, all in a matter of minutes. We make it super easy to set up, target, receive, analyze, share and explore insights whenever you want to all the time. It's a very new, agile and dynamic way of running market research and insights, but one that really helps brands and companies to you know 10 times more designed to deliver our mission, which is no guessing, but data or bad decisions ever again. A test is really unique in two ways. One, the way that we engage with real people that respond to market research, many different propositions with many different people in many different channels, which unlock worldwide audiences to engage in new ways for the first time. And second is the way that we build our software. It really lets anyone to be a true expert and professional in using market research and insights all the time. It's quite intuitive to use, yet it's also very powerful. But as well, we also come with added support. So we want to make it as easy as accessible for everyone in every business to run market research and insights and feel confident in the process. But we are aware that in the business world we are in right now, not everyone feels 100% confident to do so. And so enter our test center of excellence or ACIM where Vanessa actually works. The ACIM is, as she mentioned, a group of research experts and leaders that are here to guide you every step of the way from onboarding everyone properly to understand the complete functionality of the tool to supporting with survey creation and data analysis. We recognize this and we want everyone to get the best out of the platform, hence the importance of having people like Vanessa in, in that team. Now, a lot of people use a test in innovation functions, marketing, branding, creative design, all sorts of things, even pricing, making a test a well-placed solution to support businesses looking for insights, guessing, missing data, trying to know more about customers. Outcomes we can support with are the risking marketing communications with messaging and creative tests, pivoting products, services, or spend with success, with concept uh, testing or validation, optimizing brand health through regular tracking, and um, building a sustainable brand throughout different touch points in the year with regular check-ins or um, what we do, which is surveys. As you can see in the slide, we are in traction right now with a lot of retailers, FMCG companies, and the agencies that serve them. We are, of course, in a great position to support scaling and startup businesses, and we do so extensively too. 
And we believe that businesses that thrive are the ones who put consumers at the heart of the decision making process. What we want to do is to make that possible for anyone in any business at any time. That would really result in having better products and services that better fit their audiences, messaging delivered to the most fitting challenges, channels, and overall more successful brands. I hope that gave you a better understanding of who we are and how we can help. If you've got any questions, please do not hesitate to let me know over the chat and we'll take them at the end of the webinar. I'm going to hand it over to you, Vanessa, to talk all things brand tracking and measuring brands help. Great. Thanks, Fabiola. Sorry about that. Always the tense part where you have technical um, kind of trying to make the tech work here. So, OK, on to the kind of nitty gritty of why we're here today. So for the rest of this presentation, I want to focus on um, why bother measuring brand health and the ways that you can actually do that in the most successful way. Um, of course, we'll kind of touch on the types of questions that you might ask, the way you might utilize it, what you need to think about. But I wanted to start first with a bit of inspiration about what makes a successful brand, because actually thinking about where you want to take your brand and, make, and how you want to make it success influences the types of things you should then later consider bringing into your brand tracking research. So why do it? Well, let's look at the wider brand landscape. I mean, insight led brands win out every single time. And actually, here's three household names that you've heard of in the UK. These are just three who have successfully used Insight to leverage strategic action and have seen spectacular growth as a result of using their research data to be able to inform some of those really important big strategic decisions. So I mean, I'm not going to read out exactly what the quotes are, but treat well, use data to make decisions and steer them on what course to follow. So they trusted what the data said and it's enabled them to actually change course. And because of that, they achieved the 240% growth. Lego themselves admitted there was a need to bridge the gender gap and broaden the appeal. They research over a number of years and also then supported by heavy marketing, uh, a heavy marketing spend. You know, they were lucky that they had the ability to do that. But actually, by using the combination of data and marketing, it actually helped make them one of the most powerful brands in the world um, because they actually looked at what that research data was saying. And finally, one of the kind of firm favorites, I think, in marketeers world um, in the UK is Direct Line. So Direct Line used research to get, and they won awards for it because they really wanted to kind of bring it back to the truth of what they needed to do. So they used research to enable them to define what their proposition was, what their purpose was um, and help create a recognizable brand that had a brand benefit and actually consumers understood what they stood for outside of price, which the insurance industry is very much driven by. They tracked it over time. They made sure they were consistent in what they did with their brand. But most of all, they made sure that consumers understood what this proposition was and where people didn't understand it, they took action. And as a result of this, they achieved the most amazing growth in their own industry. And actually they're still hands and uh, shoulders above the rest in terms of how recognizable their brand is, who they bring into their brand and all of that kind of thing. So what do these brands have in common? Well, I'm going to go through a little bit of brand theory. So you guys might have heard it before, um, but brand theory tells us that strong brands are easier to choose in the moments that matter. So when I need a car insurer, I know who to turn to. When I need to get my hair done, I know which app to use to book it. And I'm not sure how many of you here will have come across um, the kind of piece of work that informs a lot of this thinking. So How Brands Grow by Byron Sharp. But many of see, see him as the godfather of brand theory. Many brands that um, I've worked with in the past ascribe to this theory because time and time again, this is what we see play out in the real world. So starting with the kind of three things that I've pulled out that I think are most useful for you guys to bear in mind as you start to think about what your brand tracking might look like. So Byron Sharp says that the brands that grow have strong reinforced memory structures and that is that in consumers minds they create strong memories often linked to emotional and um, emotional states and uh, physical states beyond simply price. So over time, this means when you say something like, 
tin soup. You think of Heinz. When you say bookstore, Waterstones pops into your mind. They create what we call brand saliency. They occupy space in your mind associated to these words and potentially feelings. So the link between them is seamless and takes less mental effort. And it's all about this less mental effort. That's what you want to try to do with your brand to be able to build it to be salient in the marketplace. Um, so going on to the second point, uh, they take advantage of their distinctive assets. So what are distinctive assets? So most of the time, these reinforced memory structures that we've talked about in point one have been created through a consistent brand portrayal through every touch point campaign and experience. They utilize what we call distinctive assets and, assets, and what that is, is cues that can be recognized almost implicitly. So before you've even had a chance to say the brand name um, when you see certain elements of the brand. So for example, even if I was just to say golden arches and I'm loving it, you've already thought of McDonald's. If I say fried chicken and the Colonel, actually you're already thinking of KFC. If I said Kevin Bacon and the Till Blue logo, you'd hopefully think of EE. So I think you get the picture. These are distinctive assets that have been embedded, embedded over time, and they are consistent and distinct for each of these brands. They have spent time reinforcing these with consumers, making sure each of these touch points actually is able to take advantage of these assets. And then I think finally, the thing about these strong brands is that they look at what's going on around them, both in terms of their direct competitive set, so where they can stand out, how do they create greater saliency, where can they be different, but also they're looking at the bigger macro trends in the marketplace. They're always looking at where they need to evolve um, and what are the bigger issues that they might need to readdress and innovate around. So ensuring you measure the right things about your brand means that you can continue to focus on driving brand growth longer term and if i hadn't already convinced you about why you need to kind of think about what your brand is what your purpose is and how you might start tracking it i wanted to show you this again this might be something you've seen it might not be but this is an infant what i have seen often so for me an infinite infamous chart um, from the long and short of it so this is something by Burnett and field for the ipa effectiveness awards quite a few years ago now and um, what it I'll go through what it shows in a minute, but I know that there is so much pressure on your businesses and on you guys to deliver uplifts um, in sales. So actually a lot of your marketing spend is used to justify, okay, if you can create a campaign that has a 5%, 10% increase in sales, that's a justification for you um, because it shows the business growth to the organization. However, what Burnett and Fielding show is that in order to gain the strongest uplift in sales, you would actually need to invest in your brand longer term. Sure, at the start of it, so this kind of yellow line, um, you might you might see an uptick in sales driven by tactical pieces of advertising but actually if you spend money investing in your brand longer term you can actually see the benefits outweigh that tactical um that tactical spend that you've got going consistently along and let's face it actually tactical spend while it might be awesome actually is quite expensive in itself um so i kind of think related to what we've just talked about in terms of what makes a successful brand. If you invest in your brand longer term, it helps reinforce those memory structures in your mind through the array of touch points, through campaigns and product. Brand is usually as well, especially when people think about creating brand campaigns, they usually are all about creating that emotional connection to the consumer rather than the functional needs or something that's price related, which, um, which a lot of tactical we, uh, advertising will focus on. However, this isn't to say that you don't need to invest in sales activation either. It can create those shorter term uplifts in sales, prompting people to buy right now. But it is best utilized when you have this longer term brand strategy. So there's kind of a widely touted um, kind of um, investment balance between brand, brand building and activation. And of course, it will vary by context. It does vary by um, kind of what your goals are, but it is wide, widely accepted that the golden ratio on budget for um, brand versus tactical activation is kind of 60% 60, 60 brand and 40% activation. 
So with that in mind, actually, if we know that brand benefit is a longer term but a slower moving metric, measurement of your brand should also take a longer term approach. And what I would finally kind of say about this is remember changes to your brand, um, which are fundamentally changes in perceptions of who your brand is, take time. So one great campaign, whilst might deliver a small uptick in sales, it's not going to necessarily change things overnight and it's all about consistency. So hopefully that's kind of set up a bit of the brand theory about the way that brands grow, what's important to consider, because actually now the big question is, okay, we know all these things are important and we've got to focus on them, but how do we ultimately, ultimately measure the brand? So in this section, I'll talk you through how tracking is evolving and the types of questions you might utilize to understand your brand longer term. To start with a basic definition first though, because of course I've talked about brand measurement, I've talked about brand tracking, but it's not always obvious what brand tracking is. You know, a brand is quite an abstract thing. So, so why do you want to track it? The reason is brand tracking is a direct line to the right data, which answers the very questions you're trying to ask and comes from consumers who truly matter, for, matter to you. It's essentially focused on those specific business questions and is a source of data that a business can't produce themselves, no matter how hard you try. This is actually from consumers. These are the people who purchase your brand, which is why brand tracking, when done right, is a very powerful tool to your businesses and can be activated in the right ways um, in order to help drive those strategic decisions beyond simply volume data and sales data. So um, a couple of steps here. So first to kind of think about laying the groundwork, I'll talk a little bit about how we might do this um, and kind of set, think about setting up a tracker at a test and then finally kind of diving into what types of questions that you want to, um, that you, you should be asking on a brand tracker. So laying the groundwork, I think is really important. When you approach a brand tracker, there's three main considerations, which I think that you need to ask yourself to ensure that actually you can drive that strategic action in your business at the end of it. Because the worst thing is having a brand tracker that no one looks at. And, you know, I've worked with clients in the past who had trackers like that. And actually it's through being able to to do stakeholder interviews, understanding what the main stakeholders wanted from the tracking, we were able to revolutionize it to actually be something that everyone in the business bought into, that everyone looked forward to seeing the results to. But that's because we got these three things right. So the objectives, what are the business questions that the tracker is hoping to inform? What are the teams you're creating a tracker for? And what are the types of action you're hoping to take off the back of it? Because if you want to inform, um, you know, marketing strategy and you don't have any brand imagery straight statements in your tracking, well, if you had known that up front, you'd be able to ask it um, and have the answers at the end of it. If you have these clear questions in your mind, so who are the teams? types of actions, what are you hoping to inform, what are the business questions, it will ensure you keep targeted and focused in what you are asking. And it also ensures that the tracker serves the need of the business, which is ultimately one of the most important things. Secondly, KPIs. So are there any KPIs which the business is trying to reach and where can the tracker support this? So the tracker can be used alongside other data sources you might have, and I would actually strongly encourage you to do this. The best trackers that I've seen are ones that take into account, and when they're presented back to the business, they, they, you know, they don't stand in isolation. So think about how the tracker can support other sources you might have, and what KPIs um, this might inform. So for example, if you talk about one of your KPIs is about penetration within the market, then actually the tracker might be able to support this through understanding levels of consideration and claimed usage within the market without you having to purely rely on something around sales data. Um, and I think that's quite a neat thing because the thing about the brand tracking is it's interrelated. You can cut different data sources or different questions um, by questions that you've put in the tracking which can make it more powerful and I think finally just in terms of laying the groundwork the frequency so how often should you run it and 
how does it tie into your growth ambitions? When are your brand planning cycles and when should the tracker feed into it? It's no point running a brand tracker if your brand planning cycle is in September, yet the tracker has run at the um, end of August. That doesn't allow you enough, enough time to do the tracking justice and then be able to integrate those um, brand planning thoughts into the kind of bigger cycles that you've got there. The other thing that I think informs frequency is when are your campaigns? So if you're able to have um, brand campaigns and advertising campaigns, when do you need a read on how they have done in order to inform what you do either um, for the rest of this kind of campaign period or actually in the future? How do you optimise next time round? So if you bear in mind those types of questions, that will tell you about what frequency you should run tr the tracker on. Typically, um, having a more consistent read is better. However, what I would say is if you haven't done, you know, if you don't have any um, marketing spend, then probably doing something every month is not going to necessarily be the best use. You might instead think about doing something every quarter or every six months based off um, specific areas that you're trying to innovate into or that kind of thing. So how do we recommend kind of laying out these brand trackers once you've got all those questions what do you do next so if you do it in the attest way so i've called this the attest way but actually this is where the research industry is as a whole is wanting to go so with consumers having um using mobiles more and more attention spans being incredibly short um and actually there's a big push to keeping uh, respondents engaged. We believe that keeping questionnaires to around five minutes keeps it efficient, fo focused and useful. It's also, um, you know, it keeps your respondents engaged, which ultimately means that you get better quality data in the back end. So giving you a read on the KPIs is what you care about. Um, so focusing on being able to focus on how your brand is doing and understanding where you need to focus is where you need to focus the tracker. So what are those KPIs that you've kind of defined up front? It doesn't need to be, I think we talk about streamlined trackers quite a lot here at Test as well. We shouldn't try to overload the tracker with lots and lots of information because what that what happens and I've seen it happen in my own um, past is that you end up with a you know best intentions 15 minute survey but then someone else says oh I want that another person says I want that and then it ends up being this horrendous 30 minute beast that actually becomes very hard to refine back and and so I think the thing about the beauty of the attest way is that we start with this kind of five six seven minute magic that means that we keep it streamlined and focused you don't need all that information at once however we also here at attest have these ideas of having modules and this is actually allowing you to do separate pieces of research which focus on the key needs that you might need additional depth on, but also flex out when you naturally need it. So you can see the example that I've got up on this screen here. We're running the tracker at the end of every quarter, but actually if you run a separate module during that time based on your additional, need, additional needs, so you run a piece of profiling in quarter one, in quarter two, you do a bit of claims testing, which then might actually feed into a campaign test in um, quarter three or four. You might do that a couple of times. It doesn't all need to be bundled up into that tracker. And actually, indeed, having flexible modules allows you to flex in and out when you want. So what do you measure? Um, I think typic I'm going to go for what we would typically suggest um, a tracker should at its most basic include. So awareness. Um, you can ask awareness in three ways. So here's some screenshots about what it looks like on our platform. Um, unprompted. This is top of mind awareness and it shows you the share of thoughts you have amongst your consumers. It tells you how strong your brand is um, and it tells you whether you're beginning to create some of those stronger memory structures that we talked about before in terms of those most successful brands. But be aware, you know, unprompted awareness is actually a very hard metric to shift. So like I said before, if you do one brand campaign, don't expect this to go up 
100% because it probably won't. Um, I would say that it's a very useful measure though in terms of saliency. It can also tell you a lot about your competitive set. Who are the brands that are winning? Who are the brands that are coming to mind in the moments that matter? Um, prompted awareness is literally as the name says. So here you can look at the name alone. So you're literally prompting with the brand name. Um, and then finally, logo awareness. Quite often prompted awareness and logo awareness may well be asked in, in the same way, but it's often useful prompting with a logo because people remember logos more than they might remember a name. So in theory, logo awareness should be higher than the prompted awareness if you are quite new to the market. If you remember those memory structures, again, that I talked about before, logos are kind of, you know, they are a series of shapes, visuals, colours. This is the type of thing that the mind remembers more easily um, than words a lot of the time. I would then always recommend a measure of consideration or purchase intent. Um, both of these get to relatively similar things. So are you in the consideration set? What other brands are people um, or consumers thinking of as well as your own? This gives you um, ultimately the types of brands that you're competing against and actually is a really useful measure of if you're able to take share from other brands. So in this example, I've got consideration, but claimed purchase intent, which is also, as I said, a similar kind of measure, is slightly harder than consideration because it goes a tiny bit further in terms of the subtleties because you are talking here about claimed purchase, which brand are you most likely to purchase, um, and then kind of a likelihood to want to do that rather than a kind of straight up consideration um, question. Imagery, uh, so brand imagery is one of my favorite things. It, as a smaller brand, you might not necessarily um, include this for your own benefit, but you may well include it because you want to understand how are competitors seen? What are the smaller up and coming competitors doing that I potentially need to keep an eye on? So imagery is, as I said, one of my favorites. It gives a great steer on whether you're meeting the proposition that you defined for your brand. Are you authentic? Do consumers see you as being easy to use if they are key KPIs that you've set yourself? This can not only help understand whether the right proposition for your brand is being realized by consumers, but also what areas your competitors are winning in and where you might need to differentiate. Um, I love this because it ensures that you can understand the levers that you might need to pull. If your consideration is low, what areas can you dial up to get more people to consider you? And actually, where is your competitor winning? Is that an area you should avoid altogether? Or can you put a different distinctive spin on an area that they win in? And finally, when you do get to the results, so here's a screenshot of just what it looks like on the Attest platform, um, which is super interactive. So actually what I always say is, you know, go beyond simply what the question says and um, begin to profile certain types of consumers, understand if they are reacting in this right way towards your brand, if they are demonstrating the behaviours that you are expecting of your target audience. You can also use this to look at, you know, my example before, do people consider your brand and look at the perceptions of how they differ to those who don't consider your brand. This gives you those levers. How do you move people from non-consideration to consideration? You've done all the legwork up front in defining the questions you want to answer and being able to manipulate the data. Um, but being able to manipulate it a little bit can really shed a lot of light on some of those strategic business questions as I've described. So, what can you do with it? So this is kind of very a very short couple of slides just about um, how you can use tracking. I think it's more to give you kind of, we talked about the kind of main KPIs. This is to offer a bit more inspiration in terms of the ways that you can interpret it, what you can use brand tracking for. So it can be used to track, uh, to test strategies that you have implemented. Did you change your brand proposition six months ago? Is it embedding with consumers? That's something you can test. Did you, over, did you take over a brand and actually now you're trying to catch up with the latent awareness that that old brand might have had in market? This is something that you can do to test a strategy. 
proof of success, so whilst a longer term measure, trending brand health over time can tell you about the state your brand is in and also be able to show your business that, you know, that investment in brand health that you made 12 months ago, that you made six months ago, is beginning to have an impact on how consumers see us. And actually, that's a real kind of, you know, that's a justification for how your brand is growing and that it's growing in the right way. Discovering opportunities, so discover areas you need to grow into or gaps in the market. I think international comparisons, if you are in several markets, you can choose to compare your brand across markets. And actually on the Attest platform, you can set up, you know, I know we talked a little bit about traditional research before about it taking quite a long time to navigate the kind of 10, 20 steps from uh, RFP to actually running the project. Well, on the Attest platform, you can simply copy the actual um, brand tracker, get it translated, and then set it. And actually, you're able to do that within a day rather than days, which I think is awesome. Um, market knowledge. So, what are the trends in the market that you're in currently? What are the attitudes that might be impacted um, if you do choose to uh, launch in another market? What are the nuances you might have to take into account for your next campaign? And then finally, competitors. So I would always say to all our clients, make sure that you're tracking competitors. Try not to, if you can, focus on yourselves in isolation, because as I've said you know, before, you need to keep an eye on what they're doing. You need to know where the opportunities are. You need to know actually the market leader, maybe that's not where you're focused on trying to do, but you need to know what are the brands are doing and therefore what are the areas and opportunities that you need to look into because of course that's one thing that you don't have is you don't have the sales data from another brand but actually what tracking can show you is um, the kind of saliency of the brand the level of consideration and what areas they might be winning in that you're not and um, don't forget this is just a very quick reminder don't forget to think about what does tracking bring versus other data sources? So that's where you can really drive home the power of tracking. Who are your stakeholders? Um, because that informs how you create your KPIs and who this is for. And always keep in mind your objectives. Um, so if I can offer a very quick um, kind of summary of the points that I've gone through before I hand back over to Fabs very briefly. Brand tracking measures the state of your brand and can give rise to some really powerful levers of where to focus, where the opportunity is and how your brand investment is landing. Streamlining brand trackers is the future. So I've talked about five, six, seven minute magic. You don't need to overload this one tracking vehicle with a load of questions. And actually adopting a modular approach can actually give you better depth and focus at the times you really need it, rather than relying on, oh, we've got to run the tracker only at the end of every quarter. And finally, remember anything you do do takes time. Brand is worth investing into longer term, but don't expect one campaign to change consumers' minds. Consistent efforts, however, are the most well rewarded in the long term, as we can see from some of those most successful brands in the market. And before we finish, I'd just like to hand back over to Fabiola for a final few um, words. So, Fabs. Yes, thanks, Vanessa. Um, so great to have a listen to to what you just said. I think there's a lot of valuable outcomes for everyone, particularly for me, there's a lot to learn. Um, just a quick one to mention to those of you coming from the Copy Club that we've um, launched in partnership with the Copy Club some exclusive uh, pricing options that we're more than happy to discuss with you if you'd like to um, learn more about them. Um, here are our contact details, mine and Vanessa's. You can just get in touch with me or with Tanzin at the Copy Club and we're mo more than happy to share them with you. Alternatively, if you're not from the Copy Club but would like to hear what these are, um, also happy to share them with you as part of the webinar. Thank you so much and we're going to go through through some of your questions now. Great. Um, you guys can still hear me, can't you? Yes. So, um, will I go through these fabs? So will we get the slides after the call? Um, if I can address that one first. So we will um, be sharing around the link to all the attest webinars um, and you'll be able to access the kind of recording based off that. 
Um, it will be available afterwards. So someone's asked as it's recorded, will it be available afterwards? Yes, please do share across your teams. Absolutely, you know, even if you're trying to educate them about what brand trackers are, I think that hopefully this has been a really good resource for you just in terms of the basics of what it should cover and thinking about it. Um, can we share best practice brand trackers? So this is something that we can do. Um, and we've kind of got, I think at a test, we've got uh, a couple of kind of, this is the types of questions you will ask, and this is the way, um, this is the way that you're able to do it. So we can share that afterwards. Everything's available on our website as well. Um, oh, here's a great question. So is there a way of marrying commercial and brand tracking? Do we have examples of this done well? So I would always, I think it's interesting marrying the commercial and brand tracking. So things like um, sales data, you shouldn't use brand tracking as, a, as a, a vehicle to be able to be your input for sales data because that's definitely not what it is. It is always about claimed um, behavior brand tracking. So it's about people's perceptions as well. So I think that there is a way to be able to marry commercial and brand tracking. You can look at things like consideration and purchase intent, but what you'll kind of need to do is understand um, how potentially sales data follows the same pattern as um, tracking data you'll also need to consider where there's um sometimes brand tracking data might either be a lead metric or it might be a lag metric to sales data so once you've got several data points you're actually able to see how they marry up together like that and i would say for different industries that actually works in slightly different ways um i would say that in terms of commercial um in terms of what you're trying to do commercially brand proposition for example if you're saying that you want to be the best brand for um broadband then actually brand tracking data can help you do that so if you're not quite hitting the mark actually the brand tracker is a perfect vehicle to understand the reasons why the target consumers and that kind of thing and i would say in most instances you do see this wonderful marry between um commercial and tracking data um oh this is uh, another interesting question from someone so how would you find the relevant cues for a given category and how would you test the mental availability of a given brand regarding this these cues so how would you find the relevant cues for a given category so i think that category cues are probably not quite what i would probably use brand cues for and um, but what you can do is look at what your competitors are using in terms of their logo or their tagline or um and and then understand how they've implemented those things whether consumers can actually um associate specific attributes such as color such as um a tagline to that specific brand so just simply kind of looking at what are the kind of creative markers that you're trying to influence and implement in your creative campaigns they are what your relevant cues will be and i think testing the mental availability of these cues one of the ways that you can do that is of course through um so you could ask it within our questionnaire you could do um ways of kind of saying uh, thinking about this brand, which colour do you associate to it? So that could understand whether Coca-Cola is always related to red. Um, so there's ways that you can ask the questioning like that. On the attest platform, we don't do kind of implicit cues, which some um, which some more kind of traditional research agencies might do. So they do timed kind of brand cues. How long does it take for someone to associate the colour red to McDonald's? Um, but actually, I think in terms of testing that mental availability, distinctive assets can be tested in the way that I've just described, but also actually understanding unprompted awareness. So that will tell you the share of the market that is being occupied by each of these brands. So if I said to you, um, I'm going to use the Coca-Cola example again, think of a soft drink. Um, you would actually see Coca-Cola being absolutely smashing it at the top, but actually someone like Appetizer, which I really like, um, being quite a lot lower. But actually, if you said to me, fizzy drink, 
I'd probably think about Coca-Cola first off. So unprompted awareness is a really good way to get into that mental availability. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, I'll just see. How, oh yeah, okay, great. So we've got, if everyone can hang on, uh, I've got about four more questions. So when creating the survey, is it best to ask questions that are more open-ended or simple yes, no questions, etc.? This is a fantastic question. So one of my colleagues tomorrow is um, doing a webinar, I think at two o'clock, you can find it on the ATTEST um, website, um, Understanding Research Bias. And actually she will go through um, how you can create surveys that don't have research bias. So actually asking yes or no questions can actually be quite biasing because consumers, um, we have acquiescence, acquiescence bias, which is basically where um, consumers want to say yes. So asking it in a way that makes sure that consumers don't do that actually is a really great thing that my colleague Sam will go through tomorrow, as well as some other tips and tricks about how to create unbiased surveys. So please join that if you can. Um, oh yes, so if I have really low awareness, is it worth brand tracking? How valuable is it for startups? So I think this is an interesting one. I think with low brand awareness, I think it is still worth getting a read in the market and repeating that um, throughout the year, but perhaps not as frequently if you don't have the marketing spend behind it as maybe for a bigger brand. However, what I would say is that there are lots of different things that you can do if you are a startup um, that is all around kind of creating profiling surveys, being able to understand what propositions are resonating the most with consumers. So you can still do a brand tracker, maybe not so often, but use that flexible modular approach to be able to focus on the things that matter. Um, as part of your platform, can you analyze the results from one dip to another? So we are able to do this um, through um, Excel files. Um, at the moment, we are looking at the ways that we can more holistically do that within the platform itself. So it is possible to analyze um, results dip to dip, uh, but there are ways that we also need to think about how we can do this much better for you guys um, in the future. But it's brilliant. We do have a lot of brand trackers with the platform now um, and we've got an Excel file that you guys can download. And if you're an expert in pivot tables um, and that kind of thing, it's a really useful um, it's a really useful kind of um, thing to look at. Um, I've got uh, interested to know how you recommend setting sample. Oh, yeah. So I'm interested to know how you recommend setting sample specs, specifications, especially one on low penetration categories or brands. So for those of you who are not sure what sample specs are, that would essentially be if you knew your, or if you don't know who your target audience is. So um, if you were looking at if you if you wanted to look at and I don't always recommend doing this if you're a smaller brand because I think it is more important to kind of understand uh, the more general marketplace first. If you're interested in looking at people who only consumed low fat uh, who were on low fat diets, actually you might not know what the profile of those people looks like. So what that means is is that you would be sending your survey out and it could just be answered by anyone. So the way that you can make sure that you set sample specs in the right way so you know you're talking to the right people is setting qualifying questions at the start. So maybe you only want to talk to these low fat and um, low fat foodies um, and uh, qualifying only them in. But actually prior to that, what I'd recommend is doing a kind of bigger marketplace piece where you send out to maybe 500, 1,000 people, you do one question, one or two questions, just saying, which of these diets are you on? You set nationally representative quotas. So that allows you to get an understanding of the UK population as a whole. And then when you have, when you've actually got um, the results to your survey, you look at those people who have said they're on low fat diets, and then you're able to understand, okay, 50% were female, 50% were male, but actually it skews to 70% being 18 to 34. And then I've got other age groups um, coming after that. What 
that would then do is inform your tracking um, to be able to say, okay, I know on the tracker now, the sample specs should be 50-50 male-female, but I know that on my um, specifications, I need to ensure that I'm sending this out to 70% 18 to 34-year-olds and 30% the older age groups. So that's the way I kind of get to that. I'd, but as I said, if you are a low penetration category, I think about how you can potentially think about other uses um, and in terms of, sorry not other uses but in terms of broadening your audience because ultimately you're potentially trying to win people in other areas so what are the ways that you can broaden that audience to make sure you're not missing a trick about the types of people you should be targeting and that kind of thing um and then i've got um what's a profiling survey so that's a very good question apologies for not um talking about what that is so a profiling survey would be essentially so if you didn't know much about your marketplace or even if you knew a lot about your market you might want to say okay we've got a campaign where um in six months time we want to make sure we're targeting it in the right way to the right type of people and um, we know that 18 to 34 is are our target but actually we want to do a bit of profiling so we want to send out a survey to understand a bit more about these 18 to 34 year olds so for example one of the things that i would do there would be asking them about maybe media consumption because i want to start to think about how i plan my campaign i might also ask them about kind of um uh what they do in their spare time because maybe i want to advertise in some magazines i might also want to understand if it was a food um, survey, what are the types of food that they're actually eating and how frequently? So a profiling survey gives you that depth on your consumer and understands who they are. Um, outside of a brand tracker, which focuses on brand, a profiling survey focuses on what does this consumer look like? And all of these things, so brand tracking, profiling surveys, campaign testing, it's all stuff that you can do on the platform. So if you find yourself um, needing to or wanting to set a survey, please let us know because the ACE team are always here to help you guys um, uh, kind of make your surveys as good as possible. So it doesn't matter if you don't know all the answers or all exact way to ask things, we're able to help you do that as well. Um, I think that is it for now. I don't know if there's any more. Okay, brilliant. So um, just to say thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate uh, the times are a little bit difficult at the moment um, in terms of the way the world is at, but thank you very much for your time this evening and we really hope to see you soon again uh, next time round. So thank you. Likewise, uh, thank you so much.